Welcome back to the next episode of Keppel Basics. This time we're going to be talking about foreign data. Now, OpenGL itself is a C library, and many of the game-related libraries we might want to use uh, to save ourselves some development time um, are C libraries as well, or maybe C++ libraries with some kind of C interface. So being able to handle these in a sensible way is very important. And in common list, we're incredibly lucky because we have the CFFI library, which is our um, foreign function interface. And it's excellent. It can handle all of these uh, calling foreign functions and marshalling data backwards and forwards. And it can be very efficient as well if used correctly. Now, um, actually, let's get the REPL up because some of these concepts are just getting easier to show than just, rather than just talking about them. So here's slime. Let's make this a little bigger because it's all going to have on the screen this time. And let's load Keppel because it's good to have it here. Notice we're using Keppel default again because we just want to load everything. And now that's done, we can go into that package. All right. So we want to uh, present data to the C libraries or receive data. All right. So let's say we use CFFI and we allocate some foreign memory. And we specify the type that we might want to use uh, for the data and how much of it. So let's say this it's going to allocate us enough space to st potentially store 10 integers. What we actually stick in there is our business. It doesn't control you in that front. Uh, but this is enough space is going to be allocated in memory. What we get back is a pointer. And this pointer points at the beginning of this block of memory. Now, it's not going to keep track of for you what data types you're actually putting in there or the length. Um, it just gives you the pointer. So we would have to maintain that stuff ourselves. If, if you've dealt with uh, C or any of those kind of languages before, you know you can have pointers or arrays of pointers. So this is enough memory to store 10 pointers to integers. Fine. Um, but what about the GPU? Now in the GPU, we can allocate blocks of memory as well. But you can't have pointers up there. You can't have something in the GPU memory pointing to another part of the GPU memory. Um, there's a lot of decisions and restrictions made to keep things very fast, and we're often working with big contiguous blocks of type data. Um, but this actually is a benefit to us because they've simplified uh, the number of cases of what this can be, and so we can actually have a slightly more friendly abstraction over the top. And Keppel does this through something called C arrays. So this is how we normally make an array in list. We can give it some dimensions. We might specify um, the initial contents or the initial value. Now, in Keppel, we have make C array, but the first argument isn't the dimensions. It can just be content. So we can say one, two, three, four, five. And now it's, what it's done is it's gone and allocated a block of memory and transferred these numbers into it. Notice that it's picked a type for us, and it's also keeping track of the dimensions. So the type here was chosen by looking at the data and seeing what the smallest primitive type that the GPU understands um, could be used that could hold all these values without um, losing any precision. Um, so as an example, if I change this to 4.0, now this is a floating point number, and the result is it's going to pick an array of floats and then convert the other values that weren't already floating point numbers to floats themselves when it uploads them. Um, this is very handy for dealing with the REPL um, because it's just incredibly easy to throw this data up here. But it does obviously come at a very slight cost, and that's performance. So what it's having to do is scan this array and come up with a type that'll work. Um, and then it's going to have to go through and convert all the values to make sure they're the right type before it can start doing its actual job of making the array and uploading the data. This cost may seem like a problem, but it's not because generally in your actual code, you know what the types are going to be. So you just specify them yourself. So if you want to make a C array, this is going to have not specify the initial contents, but I can specify the element type to be int, and I can specify the dimensions to be 10, and then it creates a C array for us with no initial content set, but the correct sizes. And then we can push data there ourselves. Easy. And so most of the time, this is how you're going to be doing it, and it keeps things fast. But in the REPL, feel free to just let it work out the types itself, unless you need it to be something specific. OK, so now we can create some of these arrays. In fact, let's uh, create a variable that we're going to store one of these arrays. And let's have test and make array. Ooh, not make array, make C array. 
one, two, three, four, five. This doesn't just take lists, by the way. It can also take an array. So you can give it Lisp arrays or Lisp li this lists. Oh, I can't speak today. And it knows how to handle them. It can also take multi-dimensional um, Lisp arrays, and it knows how to handle those as well. Now we've got some data, we want to be able to access it. So normally we would use a ref and then the name of the array and the index. Now, what we do in Kettle is we just say a ref C. And this lets us look into the C arrays and pull back the value. And as you would expect, um, we can use setf as well. Here's setf, we're going to set the um, value at index 1 to be 10. And then we go and look at it and we see that value has mutated. One of the other things that we want to be able to do uh, with arrays is actually we want to pull the whole contents back into Lisp and maybe push Lisp data back into the array. So let's do that now. We'll take test and we'll say pull g test. See we get all the data and there's um, our value that was modified, our 10. So pull g's job is to pull anything from, from foreign data into Lisp and we're going to see what else it can work on in later videos. Now it's returned this data as a list, because a lot of the time when we're pulling back this foreign data, it's uh, it could be at the end of some processing on the GPU, and what we want to do is aggregate the results. We want to run map or reduce and do all these things on this data set. So I thought that as a default, lists was a, were a very good idea, and then, again, very nice for working in the REPL. Um, if people want to be able to pull back into a Lisp array, uh, let me know, and we'll work that as well. Maybe we do pull G into or something like this. Okay, so now we've got this data, we can look at its partner in crime, push G. Push G will take some data and push it into a foreign array. If we pull test again now, we can see that it's been mutated. Um, if you want another copy of a given array, you can say clone. Oops. C array test. And it will give you a new one. Uh, another thing we're able to do with sequences is get a subset of them. So here's subsequence, um, and as you might guess, subsequence C is what we use here. And we specify the start and the end, and it gives us a C array. So let's pull this. Actually, first, let's stick it in a variable. And then pull. See, we've got uh, this list with this data in. Um, which makes sense because we've taken a subsequence of the original list, so it has the data there. Um, now let's push data to it. So let's push G and two new values, 1 and 12. Push it into test 2. Now when we pull test 2, as we would imagine, the changes have been made. But if we pull test, we see that the changes are also there. Subsequence gives you an array that shares memory with the original array. So no copying happens without you specifying it with clone. Um, this can be very useful, but also has its hazards. Make sure you know um, where you're sharing data, uh, because if you start trying to modify them at the same time, you'll give yourself issues. Right, so one of the other things we might want to do is create a C array and then free it at the end of a scope. Um, so we can say with C array, and then we'll clone a C array, we'll clone test. Oops. And we're going to print its contents. So print pull G, and I've actually got this syntax wrong up here. We need to give it a variable name for this scope. So temp is going to be a C array that at the end of this block is freed. And I'm talking about freeing memory, so I'm obviously touching on the fact here that in Common list we're used to the garbage collector taking care of our memory for us, and that is not so um, with these foreign libraries. So every C array you make, you must free if you don't want to leak memory. Now in the future, I'm probably going to provide some parameters to make sure that the garbage collector can look after this stuff for you. But it's a good practice to get into to managing these things yourself. Actually, th there are two things. Like one, in a lot of kind of performance uh, critical areas, you don't want the GC to be overburdened. You want it dealing with as little as possible, and you want to take care of this because you know quite explicitly when these things are going to exist. Take a 3D model in a game. You load it in, say at the start of the level, you might delete it again at the end of the level. These are defined points in time where you can put these hooks to create and free. 
Um, the other reason is that these other libraries you're dealing with um, are not going to respect to this idea of a GC owning the data, and so we have to be able to deal with those correctly. While we're on the subject of the um, foreign memory itself, let's have a look at the uh, pointers again. If you need to get the pointer to a C array, you can just say C array pointer, and the array in question, there's a pointer to that point in memory. Obviously, be careful what you do with this, because if you free it, uh, you're going to give yourself issues. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is you might have a pointer, and you might want to make a C array using it. So we might make um, a C array from a pointer, and then we have to specify dimensions, type, and then provide the pointer itself. Now, in this case, I'm going to use CFFI to foreign alloc, and we're going to make the correct number of integers of space. I hit return, and what we get then is a new C array that wraps that foreign memory. Um, so then we can use it just like we were doing before with AREFC and subsec and all those kind of things. Um, another little thing you might want to do is that it's all very well having this kind of printed representation, but it doesn't tell you very much. So if you want to be able to see a little bit of what's in memory, you can say print mem test, and it's going to print you out uh, the contents. And so you can see, actually, let's uh, call G test for comparison. Here's R2, R1, here's 12, here's R3, and R3. Notice again, you're looking into other parts of memory, so you're going to see all kinds of things there as well. Uh, do be careful with that. Print mem also takes another argument, so you can actually specify how much memory. Whoops. Um, G, sorry, print mem, uh, takes another argument specifying how much to pull down. So it's going to go and format this in this way so you can see chunks of memory. Works out quite handy. And it works with a number of types in Keppel, so go have a play. Okay, so I think that's enough for this video. Um, in the next one, we're going to look at GPU arrays, which are the C arrays, partners, and crime, uh, which have a very similar syntax, but obviously the memory lives now on the graphics card. Right, see you then.